Iran. Yes, I just returned from Iran. So in case you're just wondering, you just stumbled across this video, who am I? My name is Dov Barron. I'm the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. I also am a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, Medium, BuzzFeed, and a bunch of other outlets uh, like 34 Strong, where you can find lots of my material. We have new videos that come out every Tuesday and every Thursday on YouTube, a podcast that's on iTunes called Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, where we are the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives. Uh, what else? You can find me on Twitter, at the Dov Barron, on LinkedIn, under Dov Barron, and on Facebook, under Dov Barron Leadership. So there's all kinds of bunch of ways to find me. And I am a mentor to leaders like you, people who are high-level entrepreneurs, people who want to achieve the very best of themselves and find the best of themselves, and to CEOs and C-suite executives. And of course, I do a lot of corporate training, work with companies and organizations in helping them build leadership teams based on authentic leadership and, and purpose-driven culture. So that's sort of a quick roundup of me, of what I do, who I am, on that level at least. All right. Jumping in, waiting for everybody to get here. So jumping in, let's do that as we are in this beautiful scenery. It really is absolutely gorgeous. As I said, I just came back from Vancouver. I just came back from Iran. I was in Iran, uh, actually in the, the capital city of Tehran in Iran. What a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, and very much not what you'd imagine. Um, very much about perceptions. You know, when I was going to Iran, when I first got the opportunity to go to Iran, I was offered the opportunity to go and speak in Iran. And of course, you know, I get offers all the time from places to go speak that are sometimes a bit tricky. Meaning, you know, you're not really quite sure uh, whether it's bogus or whether it's real. We've had bogus ones from weird countries and then you find out, well, it's not really real. What they're trying to do is scam you in some way. So we always got to check those things out and find out what it is. And we, we checked into this particular one. I contacted several other speakers who had apparently spoken at this event. People like Jack, Can uh, Jack Canfield had spoken there, Brian Tracy, uh, and some other high-level speakers had spoken there. So I reached out to my community, reached out to speakers that I knew, and said, you know, what's the deal with this? Is this a genuine gig? Or, you know, and the feedback was it was wonderful and that they highly recommended it. So I decided that I was going to take the gig. Now, when I announced that I was going to take this gig, it was fascinating to me how many people, you know, goodness of their heart, please don't, and not, there's no, no point of disparagement here at all. But very much out of the goodness of their heart, people would say, be safe. Now, people didn't say, be safe when I would go to New York. People wouldn't say, be safe when I'd go to Chicago. People wouldn't say, be safe when I'd go to L.A. or when I would go to the U.K. or somewhere in Europe. They wouldn't say, be safe. It just wouldn't come up. wouldn't be something that people would say when I'd go to those places. Yet, when I was going to be in Iran, that was something that came up. So, you know, I'm a fairly well-read, well-rounded, well-traveled individual, and I had done my research. I knew, I was pretty sure that the perceptions I'd been given about Iran were incorrect, and to be honest with you, I was, Iran had kind of been on my bucket list as a place I really wanted to go. It was a place I actually wanted to see and had done for many, many years. But it wasn't going to be on my holiday list. It was a bucket list, meaning that there was going to be something about that place that I really wanted to see, meaning that there was something philosophical about the place that pulled me. What I mean by that is that um, as somebody who's a student of history and philosophy, I was pulled to Iran uh, because actually the earliest parts of civilization began in Iran, not in ancient Greece where we like to think of them, but actually in ancient Persia. Um, and the Sumerians um, and the Sumerian doctrines and the Sumerian hieroglyphics, you know, predate Greece by a long, long way. So I really wanted to 
to go there and find out about that. And, you know, it was, it was a long flight to get there. It's, it took me 25 hours to get there. So it's a long flight, a long, long way to go to get to this place. But I, I did get there, obviously. I got there. And the flight arrives from Frankfurt into Tehran at something like 2 a.m. And the first thing I noticed was how much security there was. So here's this country in the Middle East, which we in North America and maybe even parts of Europe are sort of conditioned to believe is uh, the home of terrorism, if you will. And here I am um, arriving in Tehran and noticing that their security is even tighter than that of North America. What do I mean? I mean, literally when I picked up my bags, I still, after, so I've, I've collected my luggage, and after I've collected my luggage, twice after that, I had to go through, uh, you know, those machines that, that check your bags, twice. I've already picked up my luggage. It's already been through, um, through that going out of Vancouver Airport. It's already gone through that in Frankfurt, but now it's going through it twice as I land in Iran. So they're certainly concerned about security. That was kind of interesting. I thought it was kind of a bit of a surprise, but you know, all right, that, that's cool. Let, let's find out a bit more about that. I go through the airport, you know, I'm, I, I'm visit customs and immigration as you do. And you know, everybody's really, you know, not very chatty, but hey, who's chatty at two o'clock in the morning working in that kind of a job? I don't know anybody in any country, but you know, went through got in my cab, the driver picked me up, and I was being driven out to Tehran. And driving out there, it's like this long, flat, I mean, it's like Saskatchewan, for those of you who know what that is, in Canada, I mean, it is flat. And, it, and of course, like I said, it's three o'clock in the morning, so there's not very many lights on, I can't see much, and I'm feeling like, wow, you know, this place is pretty desolate. And it seems like things are really spread out and there wouldn't be much around. And so I was really having this feeling of like, wow, the sanctions really have crippled this country. And I'm sort of going along and flat, 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 flat. And then all of a sudden, you know, we are climbing. We are not just going uphill, we are climbing. And as we start to climb, there's snow. Now again, what is your perception of Iran? For many people, the perception of Iran is that it's a place that's hot, like Iraq. You know, the images we see from the Iraqi, so uh, from the American soldiers who are in Iraq, we see this hot, dusty place. Uh-uh. Not in February in Iran, it's bloody freezing. So um, as we're going, there's more and more snow. As we get to towards my hotel, which is on the very top of the city, because the city is built on the side of a mountain, the edge of a mountain on the side of a mountain, and it sort of all sprawls up and goes up and up and up and up and up until you're at the top of the mountain. And my hotel is at the highest point on that mountain uh, of the buildings. It's spectacular, spectacular view. Some of you saw that I posted some imagery uh, view from the city, uh, from my hotel of the city, absolutely beautiful. Um, and you see how big it is and how sprawling it is. And that there's 15 million people in the city of Tehran just in the city of Tehran. I mean, you know, it spreads out far more than that. I can't remember the numbers of the people in Iran, as in the whole country, but it's big. So it's not some tiny little rinky-dinky place that you think it might be. It's actually a big, sprawling city. So that was my first perception was, was that, you know, they wouldn't be concerned about um, bombs or terrorism or security in the way that the U.S. would be. Now, they were more concerned. The second one was the perception that uh, that Iran was a hot, hot country. No, it's a four-season country. It has all four seasons, and quite extremely so. So in the summer, it's a lot hotter than it might be where I am in Vancouver. But in the winter, it's quite cold. It was minus four, there was snow, and that was on several days. It was very beautiful, but it was snow. So another perception busted open. So that was kind of cool. Now. Here, I want to tell you, because I got some amazing experiences there. I mean, truly amazing experiences. So first of all, you know, I walk into my hotel room and, you know, and I'm chatting to the guy who brings up my bags and I'm asking him about the internet. And he says, hey, there's internet in the hotel. You know, it's part of the hotel. It's free. 
um, but there is no Facebook, there is no Twitter, there is none of the usual things that you would get on in North America, no YouTube, etc. Oh, okay. So I figure, okay, nobody's got the internet there. It doesn't exist. All right, fine. So, uh, so of course, I can't get on those kinds of things. I'm on WhatsApp and talking to my wife every night saying goodnight. Um, so the following night, I go out for dinner with one of the guys who was part of the event organizers. He takes me out for dinner at a local restaurant. So I'm asking him, you know, how do you guys do? You know, you don't have uh, cable TV because the TV, you flip it on, and it's the, you know, it's the national channels. And he's like, no, no, everybody has satellite. What do you mean? We got all the American channels. We got all those shows. We got all the movies. We got all the channels. Oh, really? Yeah, got all that. Well, what about the internet? Do you get Facebook, Twitter, all those kinds of things? Absolutely. Really? How do you do that? VPN. What, what is VPN? No, it's, it's an app. And what it does is it moves your your IP address around, so it looks like I'm actually um, going into Twitter from Switzerland or from from another country that allows those things. No problem. Suddenly, everybody is online. Now I'm beginning to realize, oh, everybody's online. Everybody's watching Western TV. So again, the perception is completely crushed. So this is one of the interesting things. When I talk about culture, when I go into a company, uh, one of the things that I'll say is, tell me about your culture. And very often, a company will, as I've said in some of the other messages here, you know, they'll hand me a brochure and go, this is our culture. No, that's a brochure. Tell me about your culture. No, they go, but that, that outlines our culture. That's what our culture is about. I know it outlines it, but I guarantee you it's not the culture. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, put me undercover, put me inside the organization for a little while, and I'll tell you what the real culture is. Well, the culture in Iran officially is that there is no Western TV, and there is no Western um, internet, but the actual culture, the subculture, which is actually m more dominant, is that everybody's watching satellite TV, everybody is tuned in, everybody is watching YouTube, uh, following your videos, everybody is on Twitter. So it's, it's amazing to see how far away from our perception and what we perceive it to be, it actually is. Very, very different indeed. So that was another mind blower to, to get that. Next thing is, you know, what is your, I'm gonna ask you, what's your perception of how women might be treated in Iran. Do you think that they are treated poorly as second-class citizens? Do you think they're treated equally? Do you think that they are made to wear the full, as I like to call it, and of course it's totally politically incorrect, but beekeeper outfit, you know, everything is covered up, and you know, and you're looking at, the, they're looking through a mesh on their eyes. Is that what you think it's like? Well, I've got to tell you that even though, again, I'm well-read and fairly knowledgeable, I thought there'd be a lot of that, if, if not all, certainly didn't expect it all to be like that, but I thought there'd be a lot of that. Here's the truth of the matter is, as you get out of the city and as you go more provincial, of course, there is more of that. But in the city, no. When you go out into different areas, you will find a lot of women who are in the all black and the head covered and all the rest of it, but the faces are still showing, no problem. But the majority of women, were very well dressed. I mean, they were beautiful. They were really very attractive women. They were all very well dressed, very Western clothing, the highest um, brands you can imagine. They were wearing those beautiful shoes, beautiful outfits. They did wear a head scarf, but it didn't, it wasn't covering everything. It was literally just looked very beautiful. It was just wrapped around their heads and looked very pretty. Um, and, you know, it was all kind of matched and, and the makeup was perfect. I mean, in many ways, it was kind of, my perception at least, Cardassian-esque, meaning all the women um, had their false eyelashes on, their hair was done. Mo many, many, many women were actually blonde. That was another surprise for me, that they had dyed their hair blonde. So very impacted and influenced by the West again. So, you know, a lot of blonde women. Uh, what's more is many of the women that I met and had conversations with, now I will admit that I was speaking to, in these occasions, women who were professionals, who were a part of the organization that was bringing us in to speak, or that they were women who were at the uh, event that I was speaking at, which was the World uh, Management Forum, the ninth actually, the ninth annual uh, 
annual, World Annual for, Forum. So many of those women, uh, m most of them, had at least a postgraduate degree. Uh, many of them had masters and a few of them actually uh, met, had double PhDs and often not working in the area in which they had gotten their masters or PhD. They're working in other areas. All extremely bright, extremely educated. In fact, the largest portion of women in Iran, uh, the, the largest portion of people rather uh, in Tehran who go to post-secondary education are women, not men. There's more women in post-secondary education than there are men. Fascinating, huh? So again, your perception gets broken open. So, you know, this thinking that women are suppressed and they're not allowed to be educated. Wrong. Not true at all. Not in Iran. Now, are there certain studies that they're not going to get? Of course there are. Um, but do they get an education? Yes, they do. And a very fine education by all accounts. A really fine education. Many of the women I had met, um, this was a very interesting thing, not just women but men too, had left Iran, had lived in the US, had lived in Canada, had lived in the UK, had lived in Holland, had lived in, in different countries, um, but had voluntarily chosen to go back to Iran. That they loved their country, and they wanted to be there, and uh, even though they'd lived out of the country, I mean, like I said, I met people who lived in Manhattan and, and had chosen to go back to Iran, that they wanted to live in that country. So, you know, not so horrible after all. So there's lots and lots of education. That's another big surprise for most people is to discover that women are highly educated in Iran and that they are not there because they're being forced to be there. They're actually there because they want to be there. So that was another shift in perception. It was really amazing. But I want to take it a step further for you. And this is really about understanding uh, how we perceive things versus how things really are. Uh, I think it was, wasn't the, was it the last, yeah, it was the last morning I was sitting in the hotel, in the breakfast area, you know, it's buffet breakfast, I was sitting there, and I was meeting up with a couple of the other speakers from the event. And uh, so the speakers were, were, there was only one who was an Iranian speaker, the rest, were, uh, rest of us were uh, from, two from the UK, uh, Australia, and uh, myself, so two, two, one who was an Aussie, Greek Aussie, uh, Nick Halleck, um, Andrew Grill, who was an Aussie from the UK, um, Anthony uh, Thompson, who is the president and founder of Metro Bank and Atom Bank in the UK, uh, myself and Reg Athwal, who was born in the, uh, brought up in the UK and then uh, went to uh, live in Dubai and does business, most of his business now in Dubai. So, you know, we were all these international speakers and I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for these guys. I've had my coffee and I'm just sort of sitting around. And as I'm sitting with them and I'm watching, uh, I'm just paying attention to the people around me. And over there, on, the, on, on that sort of table over there, were three men. Two who were, I would say, in their mid-60s and one who was about mid-40s. And of course, they're all talking away in Farsi. I have no idea what the heck they're saying, but you know, I'm just sitting there with my coffee and sort of people watching, as you do. And as I'm people watching, I suddenly see this lady come in in the all black. <coughs> you know, she's covered from head to toe. You can see her face, but everything else is covered up. So she's she walks into the into the room, and as the men see her, all three men stood up. All three men stood up, pulled their chair back, made room for her, greeted her until she had a seat. They honored her presence. I was in awe. Here's my perception smashed again. Phenomenal. And I just watched. And then about five minutes later, the younger man got up to go and get something from the uh, the part of the food area and as he came back I motioned him over and said do you speak English and he said eh, a little he actually spoke very good English but <coughs> he thought it was a little and I told him that I said I want you to know and I want you to tell the other men how genuinely touched I was and I actually got quite, quite, kind of choked up 
how genuinely touched I was that each of you stood up and honored this lady as she came to the table. And he looked at me and said, of course. Like it was, that's of course, that's what we do. And I just thought it was really, really beautiful. And he said to me, he said, um, he said, where are you from? And I said, Canada. And he said, we love Canadians. He says, and no prompting, he says to me, we love Americans. We just don't understand your government. Now, for me, this is a very, this in itself. So, first of all, there's this understanding of how they were with their women. That was pretty powerful. It was very powerful. But also this next piece, because he says to me, he says, we don't understand. And I said, what don't you understand? He says, America, Europe, they give money to Saudi Arabia. They give business to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia give money to terrorists. He goes, we're simple people and we have all these sanctions. And I looked at him and I felt how genuine he was. And he said to me, why is that? And I said, I can't answer that, I'm not in the government. But what I can tell you is this. I said, do you feel like your government represents the people? Is, are they a good example of what the people are like in Iran? And he just did this, shook his head. And I said, well, the American government is not the American people. The European governments are not the European people. They're all different. So next time you're thinking about judging the Iranians and thinking that Iranians are running around the street wanting to blow you up, think again, folks. It's not how it is. It's not their purpose. It's not their philosophy. But it is our perception that we're fed. And it's got nothing to do with reality. At the end of the conversation with that gentleman, he looks at me and he puts his hand on his heart and he bows slightly and he says, thank you for visiting my country. With a big smile on his face. Thank you for visiting my country. I heard that message multiple times. As another example, some of my fellow speakers and I went to the oldest restaurant in Tehran. We were taken there by one of the members of the team. She took us there. And when we got to the restaurant, she asked us what we wanted to eat. And of course, we don't know. And so one of the guys, Anthony, looks at this lady's plate and he says, what's that? So our guide, Talam, looks over at this lady and asks what she's eating. And she tells her and she says, why do you want to know? And she says, well, he wants to know what it is. This lady gets a clean spoon, scoops some of her food onto a spoon and gives it to this very white, very not Persian looking gentleman, food off her own plate, feeds it to him. Feeds it to him. She didn't have to feed him. He's a complete stranger. It doesn't even look like one of them. If they're out to kill us all, they're out to blow us all up, why the hell would they feed us off their own plate? Makes you think, right? At the end of her meal, she stood up to leave. And as she stood up to leave, she looked back at me because I was sitting at the head of the table. And again, she placed her hand on her heart. And she said, thank you for visiting my country. Thank you for coming here. You are welcome. All Iranians welcome you. Surprise? I know I was. One more, and then I'll finish off. At the conference, as I said, it was the World Business, uh, World Management Forum in Tehran. So all these international speakers, I was honored to be there with them to share the stage with them. It was absolutely wonderful. And it looks like the UN, you know, uh, um, again, I've posted some pictures and some of you may have seen them, but it looked like the UN. It's like this semicircle and everybody has a desk and they all have an earpiece because there's somebody translating the entire time. And uh, Dr. Sefer, who put the event on, did a spectacular job. It was an amazing event. He did a spectacular job of interpreting. He actually interpreted every one of the speakers. It was mind-blowing what he could do. However, everybody's got all his earpieces and they're all sat in that semicircle. But right in the front, like right 
dead smack center in front of us was an imam. Now, if you don't know what iman is, it's, you know, it's the, the Muslim priest. He's the guy, the full headgear on, the full outfit, you know, he looks like the Ayatollah. And, you know, my thought was he must be there to sort of check and make sure that we're not saying anything that's anti-Iranian or whatever it was. Of course, none of us were there to do anything like that. That was not even a concept. But here's the thing. Throughout us speaking, and I watched him. I watched because I stayed for the entire conference. I watched every speaker, you know, throughout the entire thing. He took copious notes. Now, the first time I thought I saw him sitting there taking notes while one of the speakers was speaking, I thought, I wonder if he's taking notes to see if we're, you know, if we're a bit shady <laughs> regarding Iran or not. But then I saw him stand up and go over and personally thank, in English, thank the speaker. And he did that for every single speaker. And we all spoke twice. We spoke on one day and then we all spoke on another day on another subject. Every one of us stood up and spoke. And every one of us was thanked by the Iman. This guy who supposedly is our enemy. This guy who su supposedly would not believe in what it is that we are teaching. Because we were there to talk about, guess what? Business, growth, capitalism. All those things that supposedly they, they think is bad with us. You're wrong, dead wrong. At the end of my presentation, this man stood up, he, he shook my hand, he pulled my hand to his heart, and he thanked me, and he thanked me for speaking from the heart. And I, had, I was completely choked up. I was completely like, you know, my eyes were full. And he stood there and was profuse in, in sharing uh, wonderful uh, compliments with me, uh, uh, part of it he couldn't get clear on, so he had an interpreter who was telling me, but most of what he was saying was very clear to me, he was very kind, very generous, and very appreciative. So when you're thinking about Iran, next time you're watching Fox TV, or next time somebody's talking to you and telling you about those countries over there and how they feel about us, maybe refer back to this message. The perceptions you get of a place are not the place. The perceptions we're given about a place are not the place. The perceptions we're given about the people of a country are not the people. Just as most Americans are not warmongers and they have no interest in war, just as most Americans don't hate everybody from the Middle East, it's not the case. And just one final thing on, on perception is this. You think of Iran as a Muslim country, and it is. Yeah, there is a call to prayer. I didn't hear it very often, but it is. it does happen. But what you probably don't know is there's churches in Tehran. There's synagogues in Tehran. They don't hate the Jews. They don't hate the Christians. In fact, I openly asked people how they felt about those religions. Most of the answers I got were something in the vein of, of the Jewish people I've met. They all seem really... Very lovely, very genuine. Christian people I've met, very lovely, very genuine, very kind. Come on, folks. Let's shift a little bit. Let's start opening our minds, opening our perceptions. And take a look at, if you've got to get in touch with your heart and find out what your purpose is, is your purpose to hold on to the perceptions that you're given, because rarely are they true. I'm going to put out an article. I'm going to write it when I come back. I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm off to Montreal for another speaking gig. I'm going to be speaking to a large group of telecom people, people with telephone companies um, out in Montreal. And then I'll come back. And when I do, I'm going to write an article for you on the 15 top misperceptions of Iran, including some of the ones that I've mentioned to you. And some more fascinating country, beautiful country, extraordinarily warm and welcoming and kind I highly recommend it and uh, if you're watching this from the US I guess um, President Trump has made it illegal for you to visit but maybe you have a dual passport and you can go in from somewhere else um, there was one of our speakers who did come in from the US uh, who didn't travel on a US passport but it is a magnificent country I highly recommend it um, beautiful people very kind very generous so that's this broadcast for you on purpose, perception, you know, uh, um, particularly in the context of Iran and the Iranian people. So, 
I hope that you found this valuable and I hope that it's awakened something within you and I hope that you'll share it with others and maybe let's shift the perceptions of the world. So stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about the perceptions you have about a people, about a nation that may have nothing to do with reality. Till next time, this is Dov Baron, FullMontyLeadership.com. Come check me out on all those other channels. And remember, go check out The Matrix at matrix.fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership uh, self-assessment test. Till next time, this is Dov Barron, Full Monty Leadership, and I am going to check out, but I'm going to give you a chance in case you're there to write me any questions or statements or if I, let me know if you found any value in this. And, of course, if you may be watching the Encore, you can still post your questions and your insights. And uh, I do go back and I do read those and I will always respond to them. Till next time, Dov Barron, Full Monty Leadership, I'm out.